Okay, today's lesson, October 9th, is Song of Moses. It, the lesson jumps around just a little bit uh, in that we will be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 32. We'll be looking at verses 3 to 6. And then we'll jump down to verse 10 and read 10 to 14, and then also jump down again and read verse 18. Now, as I was preparing for this lesson, um, I don't know if I ever really call this a pondering thought, per se, but uh, I, I just came to look up what was resonating as I was as I was preparing for this was complaints and complaining, and it prompted me to look up that there are four different types of complaints, uh, according to one website that I found. Uh, the writer was looks like a lady by the name of Jay Eldred. I don't know anything about her, but I just thought it was kind of interesting and. Uh, sounded right to me. I, I'm not a, a doctor by, by any means. I have not studied this by any means, but I just thought that she gave an interesting pers perspective in, in the four different types of complaints. Now, a, a complaint, uh, she defined it as a, an expression of a feeling of displeasure, an expression of a feeling of displeasure. And she classified it into four different types of complaints. And the, and the first type of complaint is called a frivolous or rec recreational complaint. And it says, these types of complaints validate a person's view of the world or can make fun of or belittle something. Anytime you need someone to hear these types of complaints. And the example given is uh, someone saying, I have to work late Friday night when they're alone at their desk. So that's just a frivolous or recreational complaint about working on a Friday night and no one's necessarily even around to, to hear it. Then the next type of complaint is an empathy-seeking complaint. Now this is expressed by a person who wants to be heard. Now, they don't necessarily want the other person to fix it or do something. They just want to, they just want to be heard. So in, in a similar example, uh, now the person's complaining about working on Friday, and they might say, I have to work late a second Friday night in a row uh, where they're speaking to someone, and, and that person then responds, the other person listening says, that's a bummer. You know. Um, now, the next type of complaint is called a withholding complaint. And she talks about how this is a more toxic way to complain. And, and when people, they don't say anything at all, and they just begin to internalize anger or harbor some sort of resist, resentment uh, and start to, pat, start to exhibit also some sort of passive-aggressive behavior or, or maybe even possibly just plain aggressive behavior. And an example of that is given is, Again, the person having to work late on a Friday is like, oh, I have to work late a third Friday night in a row. Pause, and then no problem at all. Happy to be here. But said in, in a tone, in a, in, in a voice, that obviously they're not happy to be there. So they're, they're withholding something that's really bothering them. And then the last type is an action complaint. And this type of complaint... That's expressed by someone who wants action or change to occur. And the example would be a person saying, I have to wait a fourth Friday night in a row. What can we do different so we are not here next week? Now, the interesting thing that as I was reading this, it talks about, she talks about how psychology tells us that the first two types of complaints are good for us, the frivolous recreational complaint or the empathy-seeking complaint. And so they're called venting and can be a helpful way to process our displeasure. Well, I could go with, with all she could talk about as far as the, the four different types of complaints, but 
I starkly differ in opinion with regards to talking about that the first two types of complaints are, are good for us. Um, and I'll get into to why I, 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 I don't really follow that. Um, I think the action type complaint, um, you know, I, I borderline would call it a complaint. You know, maybe you're disple displeased about being there, but you're asking something like, hey, can we do something differently so we don't have to do that? I wouldn't really call that a complaint per se. Um, I guess it could be classified as a complaint, but, it, you know, you're, you're actually doing something about it, not just, not just murmuring and complaining. But uh, before I get into to a little bit more of that, one of the things that, uh, you know, I got convicted of, and, and it was, you know, I, I had the lesson about probably about 70% done, and I was in my head complaining about the situation I encountered. And the situation was that Audrey was supposed to go and take her driver's license test on Tuesday, this past Tuesday. Her birthday was Monday, and we were going to the next Tuesday. Making a long story short, the car that she was supposed to take it in was not ready. It was in the shop being repaired and, and didn't get done in time. So I, I went to rent a car, not realizing that you couldn't rent a car and take the driving test. So we had to reschedule it. So now in my head I'm complaining like, oh, you know, I, I never verbalized it, but I'm just like, oh, you know, maybe I... Maybe I should have pressured the person who's working on the car to get it done quicker. Uh, you know, maybe I should have, why am I in this position? I wasted $70, you know, renting a car and paying for gas. And, you know, just, just going through my head of, of all these different things. And, you know, there was two things I really kind of got from it. One was, I need to just be more patient because Holly even said, you know, maybe we should just reschedule, which is what we ended up having to do anyway. But but I was determined to just go ahead anyway. And the second thing was realizing that God put me in that position, that, that whatever uh, the situation was, not, not, not that God told me to go rent the car, you know, God was speaking to me to be patient, uh, but rather that God had it to where, for whatever reason, this guy wasn't done with the car. And for whatever reason, he didn't want Audrey to take that test that day because if, if he would have wanted it to happen, it would have happened. But God put me in that, that position. And that's the reason why I have an issue with saying that psychology says it's good for us to complain in these, in these non-actionable ways because we got to understand that when we're complaining, we're complaining against God putting us in that position. And God, whenever he does something, it's for a purpose. And there's something we're to get out of it. So that's why I don't think those are good. But I like, I like how Psalm 102 and 1 says how we should, how, how we should basically handle complaints. Psalm 102 and 1, it, op it opens up starting, and this is in parentheses. It says, a prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto you. I think that is what we're really supposed to be doing, that when we end these situations and, and we, we have something that, that is bothering us, we are to open up our mouths to, to pray unto God and not just be complaining about the situation. Um, you know, the Bible tells us to be angry and sin not. You know, so, and <laughs> the only way we're going to, I shouldn't say the only way, but one of the primary ways we're not going to be sinful is that we're praying to God. If we're, if we're occupying ourselves and speaking to God, then it's likely, less likely that we're going to go and um, act out in, in a way that would be against the way God would have us to act. But the big thing is that our complaints are really against, toward, you know, we're complaining basically towards God for putting us in that type of situation. And, and we got we have a purpose for us. Now, the reason why all this came to mind as I go to, the, to my next part before we get into the lesson 
is Moses, if you if you read this the scriptures that, that we have to read, you'll understand that this this is a song that Moses wrote. And Moses was commanded to write the song by God. God told him to write it. This was not a complaint that Moses just decided to just uh, you know, just do against the people of Israel. God told him to write it. And we're going to read, I'm going to read Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 19 to 22. I encourage you to look at, you know, all of Deuteronomy 31, you know, to give a little bit more of the background. But, yeah. but I'm just going to read verses 19 to 22. And it, it's kind of interesting that God tells him to write a song because most of the songs that we think about are songs of praise or worship towards God. And this is not a song of praise or worship towards God in, in the sense. It's more of a conviction, a self-conviction of the people. Now, this is what uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 19 to 22 says. It says, Now therefore write you this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed, for I know their imagination which they go about, even now, before I have brought them into the land which I swear. Moses therefore wrote the song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. So if you if you heard in there, this is a song to testify against them when when evil and troubles befall them. Now, the evil and troubles befall them, again, if you go back and you read, you'll you'll understand a little bit more that you know, they're, they're given plenty, and actually we'll read a little bit in here. They're given plenty by God, but yet they forget God. But it's not only because of that. It's also because this, this children of Israel, are habit, they, they were habitual complainers. Uh, it started out in Exodus 15 and 24, and we don't have time to go into all these. I'm just going to cover some really quickly. Uh, they, they first started complaining as soon as they crossed over the Red Sea, they started complaining about the bitter waters that they had. And then Moses prayed to God, and, and God gave them the, the instructions of what to do to heal the water so that they could drink from it. The very next chapter, in Exodus 16, you can read in verses 2 and 3, where they start complaining about hunger. And then that's when God gives them manna, and actually uh, he gives them quails as well. There's another time he gives them quails later and, and also punishes them for it, but, but different story. In Exodus 17, so we're in we're going from chapter 15 in Exodus to 16 to 17. We don't know the time duration that passed in between there, but this is very short order. These these complaints are coming. They then complained again about being thirsty, and that's where the water came from the rock. And there's probably some other complaints that I missed in Exodus, but just highlighting a couple. Then in in Numbers when they were first about to go into the Promised Land. What did they complain about? They complained about the giants that were in the land and that they were that they were as grasshoppers and they couldn't go and take the land. And obviously we know the result of that, that they had to wander in the in the desert for forty years. Then after they came over, uh, I don't know if this was the first complaint, but in Joshua chapter seventeen, verses fourteen and sixteen, they uh, the children of Joseph came over and started complaining to Joshua about not having enough land. And Joshua tells them, you have plenty of land. Go rid the people out of the land. Go do what God told you to do, basically. And then if go, coming into the New Testament, when Jesus comes, what did they complain about? Well, in summary, and I don't have a specific scripture because I presume most people on here will, will know and understand, and hopefully anybody who might watch this online, We'll, we'll see, if you just read through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that one of the big complaints is that the Savior, Jesus, didn't come the way that they wanted him to come. He wasn't behaving like the way they wanted him to behave. In other words, he didn't come as they envisioned. 
to have this idea about how, what he should be about, how he should think, how he should talk, and he was nothing like that. And they complained about it. So it's just uh, it's just habitual complaining, um, and and that's why I opened up in the way that I did, talking about the four types of complaints and what we're supposed to do with it. That we're supposed to take. We don't need to pr complain. We need to take prayer to God. Now, this all this was written in Deuteronomy chapter 31 uh, because they would also forget God, not just the complaining, but also they would forget God. And this began an endless cycle of that trouble would come to them. They were hungry. They were thirsty. There were giants. There wasn't enough land. Whatever it was, trouble came. They complained. And here's the thing that we got to recognize. When we complain, God hears it. Now, God's not responding to our, but here's the problem. God doesn't respond to our complaint. He responds to prayers of faith. So when we're complaining, what does God do? He gives more trouble. And that starts the endless cycle over again. He gives more trouble. You complain even more. God hears it. Gives you more trouble. Even more. It gives you more trouble. So, so God responds to prayer, not complaint. If you don't get anything from the lesson today, please get that. God responds to prayer, not complaint. Now, with that, I want to go ahead and get into the lesson. And so we'll read, it's called A Proclamation of God's Greatness. It starts on page 41 of the book, if you have it. If you don't have the book, we're reading Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 through 6. Would someone be so kind to read that for me? I'll go ahead. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 3 to 6, I'm in the New International Version. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. They are corrupt and not his children. To their shame, they are a warped and crooked generation. Is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? Thank you. Now, as I was reading through this, there were... Four things that, that I got from this, four verses, four things. And obviously he's talking, he, he's at this, this part of the song, he, he's obviously writing and teaching it to the nation of Israel, which is, as I was reading it, it kind of made me laugh a little bit because it's like if someone were to teach you a song, uh, you know, and it's, about you in a bad way, be like, I don't want to remember that song. But, but nonetheless, he was he was teaching them this song and talking to them about being a foolish people, unwise, and basically that they would that they're not the children of God. They're perverse. They're crooked. Um, but God Himself is righteous. So the first part of it is good that God Himself is righteous. But then the rest of it is not so good because it's saying you all are terrible, basically. Um, and I already went over a little bit as, as to why, and we'll get a little bit more in, in just a bit. But obviously the, the nation of Israel was going to forget God, and they were not going to reverence him for who he was. Now, bringing it a little bit to today, they had a decision to make, and we have – a decision to be made. And I get this from verse 2 where in the New International Version says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord, O praise the greatness of our God. And King James Version says, I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe you greatness. The decision to be made is, is how are you going to, how are we going to reverence God, even in the situation that we're in? How are we going to reverence God? Troubles are coming. 
trouble came, you're in the midst of trouble, as it was said, I believe today, you're either going into a storm, you're in a storm, or you're coming out of a storm. But regardless of wherever you are, how are you going to, how are you going to publish the Lord? How, how are you going to, how are you going to reverence the Lord? The word publish means to call out, as in, as in a call in a bold way. When someone's accosted, it's like, you know, you, you basically grab them and you won't let them go. And this says in a bold way that we have a decision to make. Are we going to grab and hold on to God regardless of what we're going through? Or are we going to try to complain and forget about the reason why God has us in this situation? And it talks about ascribe greatness unto him. That, the word greatness means magnitude. Uh, which is interesting in the New, New International Version. Um, I, I'll sometimes read both King James and New International because, like, like some, it is some, a little bit easier to read than the New International Version. Uh, and sometimes they, they'll give a translation or another, you know, they'll trans, translate a word to make it a little easier to understand. But interesting enough, in this one, greatness and greatness both go over. And so you have to go back to the to the Hebrew word to find out. But it, it basically means like magnitude, like like you are ascribing so much power, so much praise, so much emphasis upon God that you know it's, it basically can't can't be described. Now, in this decision to be made. I kind of looked at the next three verses, or what I got from it was the next three verses was dealing with three different types of people, and pretty much all people fall into this. Now, this is obviously written to what are supposed to be believers, but I even, I even tend to see that non-believers could could be uh, could could get something from this or could be included in this. And in verse four, I, I looked at it as he was he's talking to the questioning purpose. Uh, I'm sorry, the questioning person. He's that person who's who's in some sort of troubled situation and, and complaining about it and might be asking, well, you know, hey, where is God in the midst of this? And he tells us he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without a name, just and right is he. Or in, in, the, uh, in the New International, Version. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no who does no wrong, upright and justice. It's, it's telling that questioning person, you know, God is right in the midst of what you're going through. He doesn't change. He's the rock. He doesn't change. He's the strength. He's our refuge. I like the way that um, I didn't have this up and ready. I apologize. But Psalm 18, verse two. I like how it describes him. It says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. God is always right, as verse 4 says. His, his, his judgment, which is his verdict, is always right. So the situation you're in is, is right in God's eyes. It's always right. So back to the questioning person. Verse 5, I thought, was more someone that might be on the deceived side, the deceived person. Where I get that, it says, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children, perverse and crooked generation. In the international version, they are corrupt and not his children to their same and crooked generation. This is this to me was speaking to someone who thinks what they're doing is right, but really it's completely wrong. So they're they're deceived. Um, in there, in this, we see that they're proven. This this nation of Israel, I was proven to not be his children. That word perverse in the New International it means distorted. It means that you're supposed to be bearing a certain type of image, but rather it's twisted. There, man, just as an example, hopefully everyone can, can, 
can understand. When the Genesis says that God made man in his image and, and according to his likeness, but because of sin, that image and that likeness was distorted. Now, I don't have time to get into, you know, having to be reborn and, and, or born again and, and all that. But, but the point of it is that we have a distorted image until we are born again, until we give ourselves over to, over to Christ. But these people, they're distorted. They're supposed to be looking as though they're following God, but they're not. And then it also talks about in, that they're a crooked generation. Crooked means tortuous. And not tortuous in the form of like, you know, like I torture somebody. It's more like if you were driving on a, a winding road on the edge of a hill, you'd be like, oh, this is a torturous road. It's full of twists and turns, and there's hazards at every every corner. So it, it's something that's full of twists. And and what this essentially means in the spiritual sense is that you don't keep focus upon God and other. Rather than keeping focus upon God, looking straight ahead or looking up, you're looking to the right or to the left, and because of the way you're looking, you turn that way. And now you deceive yourself and think you're going right and you're going wrong. And the last verse, to me, talked to more of the confused person. Um, it talks about, do you thus requite the Lord? Is not, is not your father... Is not he your father that has brought you? Has he not ma made you and established you? During the National Version, is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? This to me was talking more to someone who's, who's confused about how they go about worshiping God. Yeah, they may be making an attempt, but they're not doing it in the right way. And, and that's what this nation of Israel does. And, and when we complain, that's what we're doing. We're not, we're not reverencing God in the right way. And the scripture that was coming to mind as I was, as I was reading this in admonition for us, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10 says, Neither murmur ye, as in a form of complaining, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. So this, to me, was all dealing with the different types of people and the decision that we have to make in these first four verses. Did anybody else get anything else from this or have anything that they want to add? Yeah, uh, for me, when I, I, I saw a lot of the same things that you saw and felt, and a couple of things. One is that it's, it comes across as well, you know that God knows the past, present, and future, and He sees everything all at the same time. So, on the verge of the, of the Israelites going into the Promised Land, He's given them a reminder of who He is and what He's about for those that might forget, and He's given them a warning in verses five and six about the kinds of people they're going to be. Yeah. And so, so. It, I always thought that was, um, you know, I couldn't imagine being in his position where he sees that he's about to give them the greatest gift he can give them, and at the same time he knows they're going to blow it. And, you know, and he's telling them exactly how they're going to do it. But he's, but he's giving them hope at the same time. He's letting them know how, you know, just reminding them in that song how great he is, how faithful he is and how solid he is. And so there's always hope. And so for me, I, I saw a little bit of that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else have anything else? Well, we're going to go to the second set of verses, and really this is it uh, after this, but it's called, in the book it's called A Rebuke of Israel's Unfaithfulness, and we'll read Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 10 to 14, 
and then verse eight. Is there someone else that would like to read, or else I can I can read this one. I'll read it, Brother Damon. <clears throat> you ready? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to read the um, NIV version. Okay. In a desert land, he found him. In a barren and hollowing waste, he shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them along. The Lord alone led him. No foreign god was with him. He made him ride on the heights of the land and fed him with the fruit of the field. He nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty craze, with curds and milk from the herd and flock, and with fattened lambs and goats, with choice rams of the shone, and the finest kernels of wheat. You drank the foaming blood of the grapes. You deserted the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Thank you. Now, as I was preparing for this, you know, a lot of times I'll try to relate it, whatever the teaching is, back to how the book titles the section. It's titled "The Rebuke of Israel's Unfaithfulness." As as I was reading it, I mean, it, it is a rebuke, uh, but to me, I, I saw it more of dealing with correction of misunderstandings, uh, more than more than a rebuke of, of unfaithfulness. That in the process of of what Israelites were going through. They came to be. They came to misunderstand either why they were going through it or who God was while they were going through it. And so I kind of looked at it more of a correction of misunderstandings as, as opposed to a rebuke of, of unfaithfulness. But regardless, um, there are four things that I that I got from from this section of scripture. And first was. That they that they were found and they were cherished. In uh, verse ten, it talks about in a desert land he found him in a barren and howling waste. He covered him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. Almost the same in the King James version. He found him in a desert land and in the waste, howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. They were they they had forgotten they they had come to misunderstand that they were found and they were cherished of God and what I I want us to think about and what, what we should think about as, as we're going through our various different trials our troubles our tribulations uh, you know the things that we might complain about is where are you. Or where were you? Where are you or where were you? You know, there was a point in time that all of us were lost and God found us and brought him to us. And we just got to remember where God brought us from, that if he was faithful to get us to this point, that he would be faithful to get us through whatever situation we were in. And this is something that the Israelites misunderstood, which is why I believe that Moses, uh, God's telling him to write about it now. We, I, when I found you, you were in a desert land. You were in a waste howling wilderness. I led and I instructed you, and I kept you as the apple of my of, of my eye. Now that I've heard that saying many times, apple of the eye, and in a general sense, I know what it meant. But I, I like to sometimes like, where does this saying come from? That's kind of a weird saying. How do you get apple and eye together? You know, but. Um, interesting enough, sometimes you know it's an idiom that is that's tr- that's transliterated. It wasn't necessarily how they said it in the, in Hebrew, but you know the interpreters used the vernacular of the time to try to 
to correlate to what was being said in the Hebrew so that the readers of the time would understand what, what that is meant. But actually, in this situation, it was apple of the eye actually originated in Hebrew. Um, and it literally, I guess if you, if you took a little translation, it means man of the eye, as if it's the reflection I would see if you were looking at me, if I could look into your eyes and I could see the reflection of me through your eyes, that's what it basically means. Um, it's the reflection one sees in the eyes of another, or there, it also could possibly mean the pupil of the eye, which would be the mess, most precious part of the eye. Without the pupil, you don't see anything. But regardless... To see it, whether someone's pupil or whether it's the reflection you see off of somebody, what that means is that that individual must be focused on you. They can't be looking somewhere else, and you must be focused on the individual. So in other words, God is focused on them, and in order to understand that God is focused on them, they have to be focused on him. That's what it means to be the apple of the eye. So hopefully that made sense to you. But that's what we got to realize when we're going through our situation, and that's what Israel Israel was supposed to realize, and that's part of that. That is, you know, a little bit that hope that that Harry was talking about that there to understand that if they recognize this misunderstanding, that they can get back into right fellowship with God. The next thing I got from this is that they were cared for only of the Lord. Yeah. Verse this is from verse eleven and twelve. In the New International, it's like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, it spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. The Lord alone led him. No foreign God was with him. So it's a reminder that you are in this position or, or you, you getting to this point or to this point only because of the Lord. You're only because the Lord cared for you. When it, it's interesting talking about these characteristics of the eagle that, that stirs up the nest, uh, I was like, well, what does that mean? That, that word actually stirreth in the King James Version, it means to waken, as if you, before God came to you and found you, or even Israel, they were essentially asleep spiritually, which means you're basically dead spiritually. But God came and he wakened you, or he wakened them. And then it talks about flutters over them uh, with the wings. That flutter means to move over to keep the subject calm. So when, at least symbolically, when the eagle is flapping over or fluttering over the, the young is to is to actually keep them calm, not to stir them up and get them, you know, going. It's actually to keep them calm and from any harm that may be going going on around them. And then the next several birds spread its wings, uh, in the King James Version says to take them. Uh, in the King in the New International Version says to catch them, which basically is the same thing. And to bear them, or in the, in the national version, says to carry them along. That this is symbolic of him delivering by his own power. And obviously, verse 12 brings it home that it was only God that did this. So, as we're going through our situations, we've got to understand that it's only God who, who cares for us. Uh, uh, or, or we're cared for only of God, I should say that. Let me rephrase that. We're cared for only of the Lord. And so we need to, instead, again, instead of complaining, let's focus upon God and what he, what he provides for us. Verse 13 and 14 comes to bring them to, to remembrance that he has given them good gifts and to remember the source from which the gifts have, have been given to them. Obviously talking about he gave them uh, milk, uh, 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 so made them, gave them honey out of the rock, oil out of the honey rock, butter of kind, milk of sheep, 
fat of lambs, rams of the breed of Bashan. I'll come back to that in a second. Goats, fat, fat of kidneys of wheat, and blood of the grape. That all these things that they would need to care for themselves as well as for their flock and their family, it was all given to them of God. Now this breed of Bashan, or, or uh, in the uh, New International Version, so choice rams of Bashan. You got to understand a little bit about Bashan, and I don't—I'm not an expert on it. I don't know a ton about it, but but what I came to understand, that was a part of northern Palestine, and it was known for rich pastures and thick forests. That if you imagine you have rich pastures and, and rich and thick forests. That is a good place for breeding, and that the the rams would have been, you know, they would have been very sizable rams as opposed to very slender and, and fleek rams, meaning that God gave not only good gifts, but He gave great gifts to uh, the the people of Israel. And this all coincides with Matthew seven eleven, says, "If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children." How much more so your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? That God knows how to give good gifts and knows how to bless his people. So, and so again, keeping this in mind, instead of the complaining, keeping this in mind should get us back to having the right perspective as we go through our issues. And that's a little bit of what, again, what Moses is trying to get them to understand. Understand all the things that God's given you and get back to the right perspective. And then the last part that I, last thing that I got from this is, and this is where obviously you, you could say the, the unfaithfulness or, or the misunderstanding uh, in, the song, in the song. Verse 18 of the rock that begat you, you are unmindful and have forgotten God that formed you. Or in the international version, you deserted the rock who bothered you, who for, you forgot the God who gave you birth. This to me was a bit of a reminder about when we do complain. This this is essentially what what's going on. We're forgetting who God is in the situation. We're forgetting that that all things work together for the, for them that love God. We're forgetting that God is our rock. In our fortress, we're forgetting all the things that, that God brought us to. We're forgetting, and we're being unmindful about who He is, and that He's the only one that, that can get us out of the situation. And this coincides with with what Moses told the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter eight, verses thirteen and fourteen. You don't have to turn there; I'll just read it for you. It says, "And when your herds and your flocks multiply." And your silver and your gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. Then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And that's, that's what I truly believe happens when we complain. We, we forget who God is. We don't reverence him for whom he should be. We basically forget what it says in 1 Corinthians 6 and 20. It says, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, before I wrap up uh, this, this lesson, did anybody else receive anything else from this or anything that they'd like to add? Uh, Brother Damien? Yes. This uh, this section that we just read, where God was uh, reminding them of all the things that uh, He had provided for them, it uh, it sort of hits home in the sense of present day because I think sometimes we go through our daily lives and we do our daily activities and accomplish this and do that, and sometimes we don't stop and think how all those things happen and how what was God's part in it. We we kind of get into thinking we're doing it on our own, although yeah. we know better, but we don't actively think of the fact that God is blessing us to do that. We think sometimes maybe it's our own intelligence, our own drive, or however we want to put it. 
But this, to me, he's kind of reminding them that, yeah, all of these things are available to you, but you didn't get it for yourself, and it didn't come to you just because you exist. I planned it for you. I've wanted it for you. And uh, sometimes we have to bring that into our thinking of our daily accomplishments or things that we do or don't do. Put the uh, focus more on the fact that God has, has a plan and it's working even though we don't realize it. Absolutely. Very absolutely. absolutely correct. I agree with all of that. Does anybody else have anything? Mm-hmm. Okay. No. Well, you, if you do, you have an opportunity. I got, I got just one last slide that that I prepared, uh, and and I I titled it "Give Thanks," and it, it's more, hopefully, the flow of what I was wanting to present has gone well and makes sense, and that ultimately I'm dealing with the complaining that that we tend to do, you know, as as lowest. Uh, was, was stating, you know, the things that we think we're doing in and of ourselves, but really it's, it's by the grace of God, it's by the mercy of God that we're getting through these things. It's, it's by his grace and his mercy that we are where we are. That's part of what I've been trying to say. And that even the situations that we're in or we're going through, though it may be, you know, the normal person would complain, I am trying to encourage us to remember to give thanks. And that's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. It says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God Christ Jesus concerning you. And no matter what you're going through, me going through that situation, being upset about, you know, oh, why do I have to struggle? Or why, you know, why wasn't he done? And he had enough time. Why, you know, why did I have to waste money? God, you could have made it to where I didn't rent this car, and now I just wasted seventy dollars. Blah blah blah. And all of that, I needed to, I needed to stop, and I did eventually. But I'm just bearing. I'm just hopefully giving you something just that that's, that's kind of a small thing. It's not a big deal, but a little bit of me in in this lesson. To us to all think about when we start to complain, like, wait a minute, what are we complaining about? Who are we complaining to, or how are we supposed to react to it? God tells us to give thanks, unless if we have a complaint, as it said in Psalm, let's pour our heart to God in prayer and not just murmur and complain. You and we, we have a choice in the matter of, of how we react and how we respond to our situation. And that concludes the lesson that I have prepared today. Does anybody have anything else that they would like to add or comment or question? I think this lesson makes you stop and reflect back on, you know, just think about all the things that God has done for you. It makes you take a moment and just think about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And had had Israel done that, <laughs> according to you know, to, according to the song, we would uh, likely be in a much different situation now. But mm-hmm. it was all according to God's purpose. Yeah, that's true. Yep, I agree with you, Lois. And and what I was thinking was that when we remember think when we remember what God's done for us in the past. It tends to build your trust in him, and the trust will lead to obedience. And if you're obedient, then you're less likely to run into the problems that you're going to run into like the Israelites did, because they were continuously falling out. They would be good for one moment in time, and then they would fall away. And and because they kept forgetting their past and how good God had been, they kept encountering problems. And the same thing for us. Yeah, so true. Absolutely. Okay. Let me 